We're going to have a guest speaker for both of our lectures this week about ethics. Ethics is very general. You're going to learn what we mean by ethics shortly. Um, but our guest speaker is Professor Suresh Venkata Subramanian. He is a faculty member in the School of Computing, like Professor Meyer and myself are. And um, among other things, his specialty is algorithms. So if you get a chance, you should look him up on the faculty page and see all of the cool stuff that he does. Um, but he's going to talk to us today about ethics. We're going to start by challenging you with some problems, and then we'll go through those a bit more carefully. And then um, on Thursday, we'll sort of continue this discussion. So in case we run out of time or I forget to say this, you did not have a reading assignment for today, mostly because we wanted you to come into this like cold with just sort of whatever knowledge you already have and not because we had you read something. But you are going to have a reading assignment like at the end of today that you need to read before Thursday so that you can participate and have meaningful discussions on Thursday. That's going to come out as a Canvas announcement at 5 o'clock today. So pay attention to that. It's uh, four links to some pretty short articles. It will not take you long to read them all. Okay? All right. So I'm going to hand it over. Okay. Thanks, Erin. So as Erin said, I'm, I'm going to try not to lecture too much. It's more interesting if I hear from you. So we have an activity. So well, I want to describe a scenario to you, and then I want you all to break it into small groups, maybe two, four people each, plus minus one. And I want you to think about the scenario. We'll get a few minutes, five, ten minutes to, just, to just talk about it. And at the end, I will have you sort of report back to me on things you've discussed and your thoughts on the matter. Okay? So I'll give you a scenario first, then you can break it into groups and we'll leave you alone for a few minutes to think about it. So, you know, you're all computer science majors, or many of you are, and or maybe you want to be. And obviously a good job to get after you do a degree in computer science is to get a job in one of the big tech companies like Google or Facebook. So let's imagine now that you actually have got your dream job, let's say at Facebook. And you just started work there in their ads division. And you have a task. Okay? Um, one of the things that you do at the ads division of Facebook, which of course you know since you work there now, uh, is that you offer advertisers the ability to target groups of people. You know, for, for you know, maybe maybe you have fo football fans who want to see ads for the upcoming season or for a direct TV package or what have you. Or maybe you have a bunch of, you know, if you have people who like flower arrangements and you have a flower company that wants to sell flowers to people like flower arrangements. But you know, the way the current interface works, you know, the advertisers don't quite know how to target people who might be interested in what they're offering. And they don't know what, what it's, it's done with certain keywords and you know, they don't know what keywords to use. They don't really understand how to use the system. Your job at Facebook, at, your, at the ads division, is to help them to, you know, to, to, to get better targeting for their ads. Maybe they'd like to know the size of the target groups, recommendations, how to grow the target group people they're working for. How would you, your job now is to provide such a service. You can assume whatever you want about whatever access you have to data inside Facebook. Assuming you use Facebook, hopefully some of you do. Um, how would you do this? This is a computer science problem. You're all computer scientists. You have to sort of figure out a way to solve this problem. How would you offer, what kind of services might you offer, and how would you go about offering these services to your clients who want to target groups? So form into groups of three and four, just imagine what you'd be doing there, using whatever you've learned in class, and uh, come up with an answer. Okay. Hopefully you've solved the problem of ad targeting, and uh, you can all put on your CV for your, your job application to Facebook. But in the meantime, what I would like now is to get some feedback from you all on your thoughts. So I'm just going to take a, we can't do every single group, I'm just going to take a few groups to any group brave enough to volunteer. I'd like to hear what thoughts you came up with in the process of this discussion. Back there. Facebook has like the privately shared things and publicly shared things. Yeah. So you want to use, you, you would like to use people's publicly shared information to collect some kind of profile on what they like mm -hmm. and then use that to help the advertiser. How would you do that? You have to do, to go forward, like how would, how would you help the advertiser use that information? What would you do? I mean, you could then give them a profile of people who like... Match. Yeah, match their... Okay. I saw a hand coming up in the middle here somewhere. Yes. So when people type into searches, in, yeah. very good, okay. 
Okay, so you'd look at people's search queries. Why would, uh, so I mean, so he mentioned profile information, a uh, post, you mentioned search queries. What do you like about search queries? Search queries, I might not want to tell people they're interested in certain things, but they'll be searching them anyway. Okay, so that's what an advertiser. Really sure, <laughs> yeah, okay, very good. That's a good point, that's a good point. Um, yeah, that's it. Could you explain for those of us who don't quite understand what that means, what a single sign-on service is? Essentially, logging in with your Facebook credentials instead of making a whole new account associated with your email, etc. Because who's going to remember all those passwords, right? Yeah. 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 So then, you, so they would get information from other sites as to what people are interested in. At least what other sites Right. Okay. Good. From the side, yeah? Yeah, a method there is sent to other methods would be to uh, just increase your frequency of certain ads by how many times you clicked on before. Do you look at how people are clicking on ads? Yeah. Have you ever clicked on ads on Facebook? No. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, not the best idea for you, but maybe for other people. How many people in the room click on ads on Facebook? While knowing their ads. I mean, a lot of times you click on them without realizing that. Okay, so for them at least it'll work fine. Okay. <laughs> that side of the room, yes. Uh, so just one quick thing about something that was said earlier, where you could gather the profiles and then give them to the people that want to send advertisements. I wouldn't go as far as to give the profiles over. Um, Facebook should be like a point of contact where the advertiser says, we want to give ads to these people, and then yeah. you know what, who those people are, but they don't. Um, just does, does that work for you? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, it's kind of a... Uh, Your team of this is fine. Yeah. But, like, why would you want to do that? Why, why does it matter to you? I mean, um, Because let's say... Like, given the, the current climate um, and skepticism you mean around the snow Facebook. Outside? <laughs> <laughs> no, so for example, Facebook was accused of giving up profiles of people who were, for example, of one political affiliation or the other. Yeah. Um, the issue there is let's say I was an advertiser, um, I could feign as an advertiser that wanted to advertise to a certain you know, uh, political demographic of people. Sure. Um, the issue was they could access the profiles of those political demographic people rather than just trust Facebook and say that Facebook is giving it to them. And you view this as somewhat different? Yeah, okay. uh, because then once you have the name of the profiles that are of that specific political demographic, you can search for them on different places, and that's when you start to... So the identity is the issue? For you. The identity is the issue. Okay. If Facebook were to give them the data but the identity is removed, then maybe it would be less yeah. of a problem in your mind. Okay. One more, one more uh, comment from anywhere? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sure this is like super unrighteous, but most people who have Facebook have Messenger, and I'm sure Messenger tells location. And so you want, you could use Geo, so how would location help? Well, if I'm next to a Starbucks, it'd be really convenient for them to post an ad, hey, the Starbucks has this on sale. Okay, all right. Okay, very good. You're all very good and very scary. <laughs> So, so as Aaron mentioned, this whole week is about ethics, and you, we might be wondering what the heck this whole exercise has to do with ethics. So this is not a hypothetical example. This is, in fact, what Facebook spends a lot of time on, how to better target ads. And what I'd like to do is actually tell you a little bit about what happened. Maybe some of you are familiar with this already. Maybe you aren't. So about a year ago, a year or so ago, it was discovered, and this has been going on for a while, that Facebook was allowing, or well, that advertisers were using Facebook's ad targeting system to advertise, say, rentals, like Airbnb type things, but rentals for apartments. But they were able to customize who got to see the ad based on certain demographic characteristics. Because Facebook put in a very carefully targeted profiling system saying, you can use this dashboard to make sure your ad is seen by so-and-so types of people. These advertisers were able to say, I want people of only one kind to see this ad or appeal of other kind. Now, coincidentally, uh, this is a very apropos for the discussion we're having right now. This, to, this year, actually a week ago, was the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Law Act, which was passed in 1968. How many of you have heard of the Fair Housing Act? Many of you have. And so you will know that the Fair Housing Act was passed to make it illegal to discriminate in housing on the basis of race or gender or other kinds of ads. What Facebook essentially was allowing people to do, not directly, but passively by providing this ad targeting system, was to do things that are essentially illegal under the Fair Housing Act. 
because they could now say, I only want people of one ethnic group to be see, to even see this ad. So it's like saying I'm only showing ads to some people and not to others. So some people just don't even know that there is an apartment available. Um, what happened, so Facebook was told this, and of course there was a lot of, oh my god, this is terrible, they're gonna stop doing this. They actually did, they were caught doing the same thing a year out. <coughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> what they also were allowing advertisers to do was to target certain kinds of hate groups. Basically, and also helping them. So the way the targeting works is you say, okay, I want to target people who match these keywords in their profiles or whatever. And then Facebook says, you know, that group you're targeting, that's really small. It's like 200 people. It's not going to be an effective use of your ad dollars. Maybe you should add these other keywords to your search because we know that people who match these keywords also match these other keywords. You'll get a much bigger group. You'll, your ad dollars will go a lot further. I'm like, okay, cool, I'll do that. So they would have things like, you know, Basically, in one example, you could say, I want, I want to target people who have, the pro, have in their profile or on their posts or on their searches, Jew haters. And they would help you to helpfully suggest other neo-Nazi groups you might want to target, so you can get a bigger group of people to target. <laughs> and now, I'm not, with, okay, so that's one other thing that sort of came up and that caused them a lot of, you know, unfortunate publicity. And, and every time, again, one of these things came up, Facebook would say, oh my god, this is terrible, we've got to fix this, we'll do something about it. And of course they couldn't, because all of this is purely automated. These systems are automated. They're, they're, these are tools being built inside Facebook to help facilitate faster placing of ads so that no humans have to be involved in the process. And it is precisely the use of these automated tools that unintentionally led to these things happening. Because the tool did not know that one group was you know, maybe objectionable in a certain way or not. It was merely saying, okay, this group has keywords, this group has keywords, they match very well, I should suggest this one and automated recommendations. So one thing I'd like you all to think about for the next five minutes or so, and we'll get feedback on this later, but I want you to think about this and maybe discuss amongst each other and we'll talk about this later is, whose fault is this? First of all, is anyone at fault? Is there a problem here? And if there is a problem, whose problem is it? Five minutes, with whatever groups you're in, think about that, we'll talk about this later. Now, but I will later on in the lecture. But I think the point of this lecture, and maybe you're beginning to sort of get the point of this, is that we're talking about ethics. We're not talking about the ethics of, for example, plagiarism, or sort of how to be responsible in your homework, and which is a, a, an important topic, but it's not the kind of ethics we're talking about here. We're talking about the larger issue of ethics as it pertains to the way in which we, you all, are designing essentially the way our future is going to look. The way our code, the code you write when you go to these companies, is going to have a material effect on people in their daily lives. And we'll talk more about these issues on Thursday as well. But I think what, one thing I want you all to think about is that, you know, when you talk about you know, all these strategies you came up with, which are great strategies, which I'm sure Facebook is trying to use as well, have these sort of moral ethical components to them. And I don't want to sit here and point to any one of these examples and say, well, they were bad. They did a bad thing. We've got to punish them. That's not the point. The point is, like with most things involving ethics, to be able to think through in a clear and cogent way about how to think about what's right. Not so much, the goal of ethical thinking is not to sort of be able to label right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, okay, I'm good. It's more like, is there a consistent and systematic way in which we can approach these questions? Because it turns out that not, most things are not clearly right or wrong. It really depends on the kind of ethical reasoning you bring to the table to think about them. And so what I want to do a little bit for the next few minutes is talk a little bit about how we might think about ethics. And so I'm, this will not replace an ethics class in the philosophy department, or even a, a large-scale ethics lecture, a couple of them. I've given many lectures on this kind. It's a very short discussion. But it's just to give you a flavor of how we think about ethical frameworks. Okay? So maybe a good way to start off this discussion is to, is to sort of say something, assert its sort of moral value, and ask you to sort of think about this. So let me make an assertion. The assertion I'm going to make is that it is bad to tell lies. I'm just going to assert this right now. Okay. Now, it may be that you agree with this assertion. It may be that you don't agree. I'm not going to take it personally, and I will not judge you by the way. This is an exercise. But if we do believe, let's say, for now, that this is a proposition we can agree with, but not question it. <laughs> <laughs> is it? <laughs> What's interesting about this is the following question. Why? 
Why is it bad to tell? Yeah. So I'm open to suggestions. Yes. It leads to a chain volume of lies. Sorry? It leads to uh, more lies. So a lie leads to more lies. Can you say a bit more? What do you mean? Can you, I, I don't understand. Uh, like, so if, let's say you're lying to one person, right? Um, they ask for an explanation on that lie, so now you have to lie again, yeah. and it just keeps going on and on. So if you lie once, you may have to lie multiple times. Yeah. But if the first lie wasn't bad, why would the other lies be bad? You're right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So, lies lead to lies, lies hurt people, okay, um, let's see, there was a hand up there, yes, you put it, yeah. So, I would say that it leads to a breakdown of trust when people are lying to each other, and the reason that not having trust is bad is because it makes cooperation a lot more difficult, and if you can't cooperate, you're going to be way less productive. So in the island where everyone lies, you wouldn't want to live there. Okay, yes. Um, I, I think on the other side, wait, are we, are we talking about the other side at all or no? You have the floor. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so I think on the other side, lies can keep people from harm. Like say you, you tell like a little white lie like to your mom about like where you're going that night. And so, <laughs> so, 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 so nice thought this would come off. Yes. Worry about that. And like and stress about that. Um, so the lie is a way of protecting your mother from stress. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, so what would, so on, the, you know, on the one hand, I want to empathize with you because I get WhatsApps from my mother like right now. On the other hand, I have a 12 year old, so I'm not sure whether to empathize with you or yell at you. <laughs> <laughs> so lies reduce stress. That's, is, that, is that a fair summary of what you're saying? Or reduce maternal stress, let's put that way. <laughs> <laughs> I get very stressed when I'm like, so I'm not so mature. Uh, yes? Uh, why does it guarantee a degree of accuracy? Pardon me? It will guarantee a degree of inaccuracy. Lies will guarantee a degree of inaccuracy. Of something. I, can you explain that as well? So, if you lie about, like, as the bridge example, right? You're trying to accurately represent the force yeah. or something. And that inaccuracy, if you're looking for accuracy, Okay, well, that's more. Okay. All right. Yes. If lies or if statements that lie become more common than statements that are true, then the society that houses these statements will fall apart. You're saying if everyone lies, no one can believe anyone. Yeah, and then. So is this like the breakdown of trust? Yeah. So it's in the same spirit of the breakdown of trust? Yeah, but more widespread because. Total anarchy. <laughs> Maybe that's a paraphrasing of what you're saying, but uh, yes, we're in the back. So you're saying that's, well, I don't understand. Are you saying that's okay? That's a fine. I'm just saying that like, it might not necessarily be like, all lies are bad. Okay. And then we have to define, if not all lies are bad, then we have to define, well, how do we decide what is a bad lie and what is an okay lie? Good, what is a bad lie? Okay, great. Okay, I'll take one more from here. Yes. So I guess this is a little bit more subjective, but personally, I would not like to be lied to, and I think that kind of like, going with the golden rule, that would probably extend to other people as well. And um, kind of in a similar, like, you wouldn't want to use someone as like, a means to an end. I guess these are more common traits. Common traits, means to an end. Okay. Okay. I'll take, so, is there anyone who has a, an, a, an, 
explanation for you know, whether it's bad or not, that is completely different from any of these. If they're mostly clustered, that's fine, but if, yes? This might not be completely different, but... No, it has to be completely different. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, if, if you tell someone a lie, you affect their ability to make an informed decision. Yeah. And if you lie to them, they can't make a good decision, necessarily. Okay, cannot make a good decision. Okay. Okay. All right. So what is the point of this exercise? The point of this exercise is to take a, a statement that is more or less, modulo of sort of other things, more or less uncontroversial, and then think through why we think it's true, and realize that, in fact, there are many different reasons why we might think that, that this, such a statement is true. In other words, the moral value of the statement can be achieved from many different directions. And we don't have to all agree on why we think the statement is true, even if we agree that it is in fact true. And when we study ethics, so morality, or sort of studying morals and right is wrong, is sort of, you can think, you might want to think of the set of rules, okay, this is, this is the right thing, the wrong thing, and so on. But the study of ethics is more than that. It's more the study of how do you, dis how, what is the process, or what is the algorithm, or what is the procedure by which you decide whether something is right? <coughs> right? So not so much the end result, but what is your process for getting to that point? Because what we like to think of is that there's some kind of consistency, that if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna just sort of randomly label things as this is an okay thing to do, this is a bad thing to do, that's fine for me, but it would not be easy for me to argue that other people should follow this random set of decisions as well. Whereas if I can come up with a consistent procedure that will take as input an action and take as an output a declaration of whether it's ethical or not, that procedure might itself be interesting. And that's really what the study of ethics is about, or at least normative ethics. What are the different procedures or algorithms that we can use to take in an action and output whether it's right or wrong? Okay. And there are many, many different frameworks of ethics, but it's important to study them because if you, if you start paying attention to the way people discuss things in the news, oh well, that was definitely wrong. What Facebook did was wrong, or what Google did was right, you will realize that people are saying that these things are right and wrong based on some inner conception of how they decide things to be right and wrong. And if you disagree with their procedure, you may disagree with their outcome, but for a different reason than just disagreeing with the outcome itself. So there are many, many different frameworks for thinking about ethics, right? But among them, there are sort of larger classes. And in fact, many of the things you said fall nicely into these classes. The most the framework that's most popular, as it turns out, uh, in a study that was shown among computer scientists, is what is called the utilitarian framework for thinking about ethics. Some people are already nodding. And you know who's nodding wants to say something about the utilitarian framework? No, you just you disagree with them. <laughs> okay. So the utilitarian framework is a, is a framework that basically says, we will decide on the ethical content of an action by essentially trying to figure out the amount of good it does, the amount of bad it does, and whether the amount of good is more than the amount of bad. Right? It's very, well, the reason why it's appealing is because it seems somehow mathematical in some sense. All you have to do, good. All you have to do is add up the good, add up the bad, take the difference and see whether it's positive or negative. Right? Um, I don't know how many of you are Marvel Comics fans. This is sometimes known as the Iron Man sort of ethical framework. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, but if you don't, it's fine. I, I'm not gonna rely on the knowledge. <laughs> But the idea of, of sort of thinking about ethical frameworks this way is to say, okay, we will assign a cost. So if I, so for example, this was very, it is very interesting to talk about sort of levels of stress, right? And bad lies and good lies. The people who said this are basically saying, look, a lie has certain consequences. The consequence in terms of increase in stress of my parental unit versus the increase in pleasure to myself. <laughs> that kind of way is okay. <laughs> So that once I do that calculation and decide that they didn't need to know where I was going, why would they need to know? It's just gonna cause them more trouble. That makes it, it's okay. In that sense, that action of not telling your parents where you're going is not a lie or is not, it may be a lie in the sense of being false, but it is not wrong from a utilitarian point of view because you made this calculation. Now, of course, you know, hopefully, and again, you could spend more time talking about this, right? I mean, uh, there are lots of issues with this. 
how do you decide the costs? How many people do you include in your cost calculation? Is it just you and the person you're talking to? Is it other people who might be affected? You know, how do you decide how much good versus how much bad? There are lots of things you have to decide. And so just saying that, oh, I'm using a utilitarian framework is not enough. You have to decide all these things. But that's one framework of ethics for thinking about how actions are good or bad by adding and subtracting costs. There is um, another framework, uh, which is quite different from the utilitarian framework. It doesn't involve calculating costs individually. It's a much a very different view, and it's sort of represented by, by these here. So the argument here was that lying leads to a breakdown of trust. People cannot trust each other. There's no cooperation. It's total anarchy. And we all go run up into the forest and sort of eat leaves and stuff. <laughs> so this, this, this basically, the, the root of this ethical framework is what is called social contract theory. And this goes back to Thomas Hobbes and his famous book, The Leviathan. And this idea that people left to themselves will exist in a very savage state. Right? And live without any rules in society, we will result in total anarchy, like walking dead. <laughs> But if we make rules and we consciously agree to make rules to live together, then the ethical content of those rules, whether they're good or bad, comes from whether they preserve social order or not. So in this case, a lie is bad not because of some careful calculation of good and bad, but because if everyone lies, then society will break down. And that's what makes it bad. So the idea is that we all sort of subscribe to a social contract to live in society and behave a certain way. When we break those rules, that's when we are we exhibit moral failings, right? So breaking the rules of society. And again, you may not agree with this, but this is a framework that is consistent and allows you to assign good and bad to top actions based on that. Okay. Um, a lot of work in this, uh, sort of political theory and social justice sort of reaches out and connects with this kind of theory. Right? Another framework of ethics that comes up from here, in fact, exactly comes up from here, is what is called Kantian ethics from Immanuel Kant, or deontological ethics. And the idea here is very, very different. So all of these frameworks, the two I described so far, basically said, well, we'll decide how good and bad our actions are based on what happens. If something bad happens, if something good happens, if society breaks down, if my mother gets stressed, whatever, we'll add them all up and figure this out, or we'll look at how society behaves. These are what are called consequentialist theories of ethics, where you look at whether something bad will happen, and that decides whether you've done something. So if nothing bad happened, maybe it wasn't so bad. Whereas deontological ethics, roughly speaking, and again, I have chapters and chapters of study on it, so I'm not going to do it justice here, basically says it doesn't matter what the outcomes are. What matters are your intent and your principles. That is what decides the ethical content of behavior. So to decide whether someone is being ethical, you also have to know what they're thinking in their head and why, what their reason is for doing something, whether or not it had a good outcome. So doing the right thing for the doing the right thing for the wrong reason is not ethical under this framework, whereas it might be ethical under a utilitarian framework. So this idea of means to an end, we should not treat humans as means to an end, is exactly Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, at least one version of it, where he says that you must treat people not merely as a means to an end, but as an end in themselves, and everything follows from that. So if you lie to someone because you don't want to hurt their feelings. Right? You say, I'm fine, whether you're, you don't want to sort of tell someone that you're feeling bad or whatever. You are not treating them as an end, you're treating them as a means to an end. Because you're not giving them full autonomy, full freedom to have their own reaction to what you're saying. So in the Kantian worldview, this would be very bad. Um, the Kantian worldview is very extreme on issues of lying and not lying. In fact, it's one of the more extreme ethical points. There's a very, some very fun scenarios where only the Kantian worldview would say that lying is wrong, and every other worldview would say it's actually okay in this particular situation. And um, one thing that never came up here in all of this, so these are the three frameworks here. So basically, I'll, you know, uh, this sort of, some of the stuff is utilitarian, some of the stuff is Kantian, some of the stuff is more social contract based. What no one ever came up with is the idea that it is just wrong because we should all be honest, because honesty is a good thing. And I'm not saying we had to come up with that, but if you but if you think about that, okay, honesty is just something good we must all aspire to, and therefore lying is wrong, that gets you to another theory of ethics called virtue ethics, which basically says that we define up front virtues that we believe are worthy of aspiring to, honesty, 
goodness, loyalty, whatever, pick your favorite virtues. And then you treat actions as good or bad based on how well they live up to those standards. Right? So again, going back to our superhero analogy, this would be the Thor or the Wonder Woman version of ethics. Where you have some basic principles and you this is sometimes called the Captain America version. So, that's not <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are many, many different, there are many nuances to these frameworks. Right? Inside utilitarianism, there's rule utilitarianism, there's act utilitarianism. Inside social contract theory, there are different versions of it. Inside um, virtue ethics, there are many, many subcategories. So there's all these different subcategories of ethics that we, that we could talk about, that we won't. But it's important to think about these in the context of thinking about the ethics of the work that you do. So when Facebook, when people say Facebook did something wrong because it allowed you know, advertisers to target groups that is considered illegal, what Facebook was doing is facilitating rule breaking. You could view this as a social contract framework. Their laws are there for a reason. We must satisfy, we must obey the laws. Facebook allowed the laws to be broken, therefore what they did was bad. Or you could say, no, there is a moral underpinning to not being able to discriminate against certain groups. That is just bad. And that's why what Facebook did was bad. And that would put them into a different framework. And depending on where you think the wrongness or rightness comes from, you might decide to do different things to deal with problems. Right? If you're saying Facebook is bad because they broke the law, then the answer is to sort of punish them with the law. If you're saying what they did was bad because it was just wrong, then public shaming seems like a much more better strategy than just trying to you know, accuse them of, of breaking the law. So it's important to think through these issues when we start trying to assign or claim that things are right or wrong in the work we do. Okay. All right. I've been talking a lot. There have been very little questions. Any questions? Any thoughts so far? I know you didn't come in expecting philosophy 101, so maybe it's a bit of shock. So. Yes? How would you quantify ethics? Like, utilitarianism would be very easy, but. That's why everyone loves it. So. <laughs> How would you quantify this? Why would I want to? Uh, so you can determine whether or not your algorithm is making good decisions. Good. So the question is, can we come up with a formula for whether something is good or not, so that when we our algorithms make decisions, we can have a piece of code that decides whether they've done the right thing or not. Do you have a response? Oh, I'm just thinking, how are you measuring the rightness and wrongness? Because like... Hey, he wants to measure the wrongness. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, do it. Because, like, there's a lot of different ways to measure something. Like yep. if, say, Congress passes a law, and how it affects the people that it was intended to affect, the unintended consequences, sure. the unseen victims of the law, yep. like the people who are unknowingly hurt by it, yep. or like uh, the way that it might tilt the playing field in yep. one direction rather than the other. Right. And so like, there's just a lot of things that you just might not so you're saying it just may not, it may be impossible to do to quantify the ethical content of a certain procedure? Well, if nothing else, it would be impossible to consistently quantify it. Okay, to consistently quantify it, like yeah. that, okay. All right. Any other comments, thoughts, questions? We'll get back to the point about quantification, actually, on Thursday a little bit. Yeah. So like, let's say, going back to the very start of the lecture, you're working your dream job and they ask you to do something that you don't see as ethical. Um, what responsibility do you have to not do that. Because, I mean, they are your employer, mm -hmm. which puts you in a tricky position. Yeah. Anyone want to answer? I, I tried to answer as few questions as possible. So. <laughs> yes. We have kind of dependent on your own disposition. Now, I mean, if you think it's immoral, I'm pretty sure like, you're going to make that decision. But if you talk yourself out of it not being immoral, then it's not immoral for you. So you, you kind of answer your question. But, the, but there are consequences. Well, he could get fired. I like eating. He likes eating. <laughs> we all have we all have things we like. He likes eating, so. He's like <laughs> so we, Google has been uh, competing for a Pentagon contract to to do intelligent sort of drone uh, navigation, I think. But things involving drones. Three hundred Google employees just wrote a letter to Sundar Pichai, their CEO saying that Google should not be in the business of supplying the military with software to control drones. So that's what answered your question. A bunch of people at Google actually felt that they should not be in this game, even if they could do it. And they have started a petition to sort of say, we want to back out this game. Will they get what they want? I don't know. But if you ask, what can you do? That's what people are actually trying to do. 
to us one way we will. Uh, yes. Uh, when you talk about like discriminating against certain groups, like when you say we're not going to advertise to these hate groups, yeah. you kind of get into like the paradox of tolerance. That yes, the proper paradox of tolerance. You want to explain that to us? Um, so the, the paradox is that when you say you're tolerant, you have to be tolerant of everyone and every view. But when you're tolerant to a point where you allow people who are discriminating or being intolerant, you, the whole thing falls apart. Right, so you, can, you have to be intolerant of intolerance. You cannot be tolerant of intolerance. That's, what, <laughs> that's the paradox of Popper that sort of talks about how you can manage to allow for competing and dissenting points of view in a pluralistic society where you want to have these points you don't want to shut them down. So, so are, are you saying that Facebook is a vine now because they don't, how, what do, how do they make the decision to either prevent or allow these kinds of targeting to happen? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like at what point do you have to cut it off? Right, and I, and I don't envy the position Facebook is in, which is why I think finger pointing and saying they're wrong or they're right is not useful here. The question is, what is their responsibility? I think that's the question we're coming back to again and again. What is their role? Are they merely facilitators? Are they, or as they say, just a platform? And not actually doing, or are they making the platform? Are they facilitating targeting? The thing about ethics, and the thing about ethical discussions, is that there aren't, there are very few good answers. There are, in only in very simple situations can you find clean answers to these questions. The point of ethical thinking is to be aware of the issues involved when you're doing this. When you're writing some code and you make a choice about, say, which default you show in, a, in an interface, that has certain ramifications. And if you are going to make a choice about which default you show, you should be aware of the ramifications of that choice. I'm not saying you shouldn't show anything or you should not write the piece of code, but you should be aware of how your choices can have effects on the screen. And that's what, what it boils down to when you talk about ethical people. So we're going to do another activity. Right? So the next activity we're going to do is the following. And we're going to do it slightly differently than before. So at this point, you decided that food is not that important and you left Facebook because you don't like what they're asking you. You, what you did do is join the small company called Mirador. This is a real company. We moved it. We're not now. <laughs> it's a microcredit company that provides guidance to banks. So what they do is a uh, small business wants to get a loan from a bank. They don't want to go through the entire process. Uh, this, they go to this company called Mirador. Mirador sort of scrutinizes their information and gives a, some signal to the bank saying, look, we think this small business is a good risk. You should loan them up to, say, 50K, and I think they're good for it. Okay, there, there are many companies like Mirador right now that offer these kinds of services. And of course, you know, this is a 21st century company, it's not some old dinosaur. So they realize that you know, there's a lot of information out there on social media and other forms to get information about these small businesses. You know, maybe the business has a Yelp page, maybe there's a Facebook page, maybe the owner of the business has, uh, has an Instagram account. Maybe there are many ways to keep track of things that the business is doing that might be pertinent to their ability to pay back a loan, right? What I want you to think about is we're going to do it for, uh, first we're going to do a thing on the board. What kind of signals do you think would be useful if you were working at Mirador and you wanted to collect information about a small business um, to be able to better predict whether they would default on a loan or whether it would be good for a loan that a bank would give them? So I want you to sort of randomly think about this for a minute. And I'm going to write down the features on the board based on what you think might be useful. What do you think would be good things to add to your collection, your dashboard of features to make reviews? Yes? I guess if you know the business owners have owned a business in the past that failed, that actually might be a pretty good thing. Previous success or failure? Yeah. Okay, good. Very good. Okay. Okay, what else? Consumer reports on like a Better Business Bureau type thing. Uh, which people have people complained about this business? Something like that? Is that kind of thing you're thinking? Yeah. Okay. So consumer reports. Sorry, I had to move on a slide. Okay. What else? Can you shout them out? Existing debt. Existing debt. Surrounding demographic. What's the surrounding demographic? You know, the city that there's 
But you mean like a brick and mortar business somewhere in there, where they are in the city, that kind of thing? Yeah, where, you know, they're going to sell to. So I'll just put on geography and demographics. Is that usual? Yeah. <laughs> so, no, explain. Yeah, I mean, they're a big spender. And they have some, let's see, Instagram about their glamorous lifestyle. Maybe that has implications for, uh, you know, how the company funds. Maybe you've collected lots of data on the lifestyle behaviors of different CEOs and you have some predictive model that can do that. Is that what you're thinking? Okay, yes. Lifetime of the company. Lifetime, okay. The company lifetime. Okay. Okay, maybe two more. Okay, one more. Personality traits. Sorry? Personality traits. Say more. Um, okay, so there's uh, the University of Cambridge came up with a basically a machine learning backed model that can use um, input from text or from Twitter or Facebook to determine uh, it's called the Big Five. Big Five uh, like model basically um, it's a good way of representing how a person's personality is put together. So this would be for which person? Owner, CEO, whoever. Okay. Oh, the the, the forward one. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. Now, next exercise. Here's what we're going to do. Um, let's see. So let's say this side of the room up to you with the red little thing on your neck, all the way up to behind you, <coughs> there, over there. This side is one side, this is the other side, okay? You're happy already, you don't even know what side you're gonna be on. So. <laughs> 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 this side of the room, you're, um, you are the people, the clients, you are the company, okay? I want you to form into small groups and think about when Mira comes to you with its form or its information, what information you'd be willing to give them and what information you'd not be willing to give them. Okay, now this side of the room, you're the bank. I want you to form into small groups and think about what information you really need from the people asking for loan and what information you can do without. Break up into small groups and talk about it. <laughs> okay. So here's how we're gonna play this. Any group from the, the borrower side, I hope you remember your borrowers, not lenders. The borrower side, throw out some information you'd be happy to share with your lender. Or we are something you'd not be happy to share with your lender. And then we wanna take it back and then and then back and then back and then back. So on. Okay, go. So we mainly identify the business plan and the CEO lifestyle as being things that we wouldn't have to be comfortable sharing. Everything else, you know, is either information that we need to submit when we're actually applying for the loan in the first place, so like the kind of business, mm -hmm. or things that they're readily able to like to aggregate. But the, the problem with the CEO lifestyle is like, let's say that the CEO is like a massive gambler, right? Uh, you don't know if they're gambling their own funds or the company's funds, and that potentially could matter whether or not. But suppose being a gambler is a sign of an addictive personality. Well, market. sure, but I, I would say to look at legislature instead. So, like, if they've been sued in the past for mishandling funds, that would be something to look at. But the fact that they like to gamble should, in, in itself, not be an indicator. But of they it. also could have an ethical persona where they're saying it's wrong to spend company funds, but I'm fine putting myself in the hole. Okay. So that that's a different thing. And, and your concern there is that it would be misinterpreted if that yes. information were given. Yes, and then the business plan. The issue with that is like. I, 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 my major is in the business school. I okay, do entrepreneurship good. as my major. So the main thing that I focus on is building financial projections. Okay. They are completely inaccurate. They have no bearing on what is going to happen. You, 
could project that you're only going to do two hundred thousand dollars in sales, and you could blow past it with five million. And there have been many companies that have done that. But if you went to a VC with with a, a business with, with to get some money in the Bay Area, would you have to give them a business plan? We we do give them business plans, but the per, the thing with VC is that they mainly <coughs> do it based on other things that are not financing. They'll look at what your projections are, and they'll ask you if it's really there and if it could be defensible. But they're mainly interested in in what your product is what their contacts in the industry will say, and whether or not they, they think that you are adequate to run that. Business. Okay, good. Lender side. Any thoughts on not getting a business plan or information about CEO lifestyle to your, <coughs> the people who are begging you for money? Any group thinks this is like, you get out of here, I'm not giving you any money? Yes? So I guess what it would boil down to is whether or not we can somehow incorporate it into our multi So, you, so then your decision on whether to use that information or not rests on your ability to predict or not predict from that data. Yes. I would like for me. That's for you. Fine. So if someone tomorrow came to you saying, no, no, we've got a good predictor that can predict from their Facebook posts whether they're going to be a good CEO, you would demand that information because now you feel like you could predict it. That's what you're saying, right? If I'm understanding uh, correctly. I wouldn't necessarily demand it, but if they would be willing to give it to me, I'd take it. That's not the same thing. I'm asking <laughs> which information would you not give them a loan without? Oh, okay. Okay, that I haven't thought through. So okay. So you are right in the middle, so I don't know which side is which. I'm going this side. Okay, fine. So you're, you're lenders. So as a lender, go ahead. Um, something that would be really important for me isn't so much information but collateral. Okay. Uh, I'm going to assume that everybody that walks through my, like at least nine out of 10 of these people that walk through my door and get a loan from me are probably gonna fail. And how am I going to recover from that? So you, you, you need to know how you're gonna get your money back. Yeah. Hmm. Borrowers, you think that's reasonable? No complaints about that? Okay, no, that's good. We have no complaints, that's, that's good. We have something that we agree on. Um, okay, anyone else, any lender wanna throw out something? Yeah. Even if his plan is totally fictional, it's based on fake projections. <laughs> <laughs> or you would say, look, your plan is fictional and based on fake projection, I won't give you money, but I want to see your plan anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Just yeah, yeah, go ahead. transmission of the information, but you disagree about his interpretation. In other words, you think having lots of debt might be a good thing. You think having lots of debt might be a bad thing. You don't disagree that that information should be passed on, but you're interpreting different things from it. By the way, um, your FICO score is not maximized at zero as the credit cards. It's maximized at more than zero, like two or three. <laughs> and it's not maximized by people who pay off their debt every month. It's maximized by people who pay off uh, a little bit of their interest every month but pay it regularly. So, 
you know, out there in the real world, there's a lot of disagreement about whether having debt is a bad thing or a good thing. So some people think it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to have debt that you're responsibly paying off versus not having debt at all. Okay, yes. Imagine, for argument's sake, and this is not too far-fetched, imagine that it is possible to predict <coughs> the likelihood of someone repaying a debt by looking at <coughs> their Twitter postings. Wait, you all know Twitter, but I'm not just too okay. I'm, not, I'm not dating myself here by saying I know Twitter. Okay. So you look at all their Twitter feed and you say, okay, I want to look at what you post on Twitter, because that will help me decide whether you're a good risk. Let's say I can build a predictive model to do this, which has 80% accuracy of predicting whether you will um, default a loan or not based on what you see on Twitter. And based on who your friends are. Would you use it? Would you ask for it? Would you provide that information? Borrowers, lenders, anyone? Yeah, back to one. That sounds pretty Orwellian and like super dystopian. But it's correct. It works. The model you have, though, has a 20% failure rate. Yeah. Like a fifth of people will have, I mean, theoretically, false positives. And so a fifth of people's lives are potentially ruined because you had a model that... Suppose it was 90%. Was not, but wasn't really... <laughs> but suppose it was 90%. Is the, no, is the number what's bothering you? No, 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 not the number. It's the fact that there is an error rate. Anything more than zero is a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lenders, what do you think? Suppose I could give you a stool at 90%. 95%. The <laughs> accuracy will help you predict from someone's social network where they'll repay a loan. Would you use it? Um, I would agree in saying it's a little bit Orwellian, uh, but I would. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because I have You're a fiduciary obligation to make sure that I do not give money to someone who will not pay me back. And so so, if so that you would use it because, it would, because you, you don't want to lose money. So I have three models. One gives yeah. you 90%, one gives you 92%. They're different in different groups. Mm -hmm. You would use that. Yeah. But Even though he's complaining about the error. Well, we just I, I would just add to that that there's error in everything we do. Yeah. And so, so like, there's no zero error. Yeah. There's no zero error. And so we have to work with what we have. Yeah. OK. Other thoughts? Yes, in the middle here. So if we're talking about like Twitter specifically, um, I don't have Pick your favorite social network. I, mean, I, I only know Twitter. I have no form of social media. So you have something to hide? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, uh, I'm just asking. That you, if you didn't have a social media presence and the bank said we need to have it, others we can't give you a loan, how would you feel about that as a borrower? I would feel robbed. Yes. Oh, we have a very secure system that no one can access to and has never been hacked. You know, we, we bought our software from Equifax, so it's really great. It works really well. <laughs> but wait, you're a lender, not a borrower. I know. Are you going to cross the... Are you trying to cross... No, I'm just... It's a good question. Was the information given with, well, for example, 
you might have as a requirement on the form saying, please give me your social media handles for blah, 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 blah. A lot of companies attempt to do this at interview time right now. They'll say, I want to see your Facebook, I want you to log in on Facebook on my machine right now during the interview. Yeah, exactly. So the issue of consent is a very important one, right? Are you getting data that can be publicly scraped or is it private information? How, would, how does that change your view on this? Well, I mean, this is terrible, but I'm role playing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's public there. So it's out there anyway. You know, we're just waiting to be scraped, and we're we're all going to be very good at web scraping after we take this class, right? So we should be able to do it. <laughs> yes. Actually, let's do the one in front of that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As a lender, you could see it. Would, would you, as a borrower, have a problem giving a LinkedIn a, a sort of handle to a employ, potential employer to sort of um, see what you've done? Anyway? And also on LinkedIn, you can even see when people view your profile. Yes. So, like, it's all like consensual. So, uh, as long as everyone can see everything, you're fine with it. So, radical transparency is a solution to this problem. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that it's in the best interest of the company to give any information that they ask for. In the first case, the action of, of withholding that information incites suspicion. In the second case, you can access it anyway. So that information would be accessible anyway. So, so you're saying the company should get whatever it can get? Well, it's, not, it's just uh, in the best interest of the company to give whatever they ask for. It's in, the best, it's in your best interest to give whatever they ask for yes. because they could get it anyway and you don't want to piss them off because they're the lender. Exactly. Okay, good. I think we'll stop at this point. We've got a few minutes left. I want you to think more about this. But I think the purpose of this exercise, apart from your very, very boring and conventional feature, which I'm very disappointed in, <laughs> but, but with good features, though, um, is, to, is to understand that the issue of whether something is right or wrong also depends on which perspective you're coming from. Right? Are you building software for clients to find banks to, to match with? Are you writing software for banks to find clients to match with? Who is the owner of what you're doing? Who is being given the power in this software and who is not being given the power? Who is the user and who's being used? These are things you have to think about whenever you are building software of a kind that is being used in this context. In this case, Mirador is acting as an intermediary, but they're acting as an intermediary on behalf of the bank. The bank is saying that we need to have good predictive models to figure out lend to. They're building a tool for them. Um, ICE has proposed sort of this extreme vetting program where they want to collect information on people and predict who will be a good immigrant before they decide to give green cards or other or visas to people. And they want you know computer scientists to help build the system for them. A bunch of computer scientists, like 50 or I think 100 of them now, have written up things and no, they're not going to help you build this. But that's another story. So the point is that in all of these systems, there is there is who, who is going to be using the software that you're building? And that is where some of the ethical issues will come. Um, this is not, by the way, a hypothetical. Like most of these things, Mirror is a real company. Moreover, as you will read the reading, and that's going to be up in a few minutes, this is being done on a much larger scale in various parts of China. If you haven't heard of the Chinese social credit score, basically it's, everyone's going to get a sort of a social credit score number, which is not going to be used just for loans, but to give you or deny you all kinds of other services, based not just on your activity, but even activities of your friends and people around you. Read the articles and we'll, I guess, talk more about yes. some Thursday. See you then.